Well, good evening, everybody. May I begin by thanking uh, Mrs. Justin Lafoy for her kind words. Um, listening to all that litany of all the books I've read, I wonder I've done anything else in my life. Uh, sometimes it feels like that, I have to confess. I should begin by acknowledging the honour bestowed upon me by the invitation to give this year's John Kelly Memorial Lecture. I regret to say that our paths rarely crossed, which is hardly surprising given our different interests in the law. However, during the late 1960s and 1970s, I was very much aware of his immense influence on the development of the UCD law faculty and on the creation of a new literature on Irish law. During those years, I was a frequent visitor to the Belfield campus, usually seeing a much-missed friend, the late Professor Jim Brady, who of course was Professor of Equity and Property Law here for so many years. Notwithstanding John Kelly's wide-ranging interest in numerous areas of the law, I'm not sure that he was much excited by property law, though I've often wondered what might have been his views, no doubt expressed in his uniquely penetrating and trenchant manner on the Land and Conveyancing Law Reform Act 2009, had he been still alive when that was passing through the Oireachtas. Whatever doubts I may harbour about what might have been John Kelly's reaction to this lecture being given by a boring old property lawyer, I can not perhaps console myself with the thought that at least Jim Brady would have approved, because the particular subject was one, of course, on which he wrote quite a lot, including, of course, the excellent textbook on the limitations of actions, which he wrote with his colleague, um, Tony Kerr, who I see lurking up there at the back. Perhaps you will forgive me if I mention somebody else before I proceed. One of my oldest friends, probably my oldest friend in Ireland, was John F. Buckley, a UCD graduate who passed away very recently. I first met John when he came up to Queen's University Belfast, where I was a young lecturer in the mid-1960s, to give a lecture on the Registration of Title Act, I think. And during the course of that lecture, he said something which I didn't think sounded quite right. I'm sure it was something to do with adverse possession and the relationship to registration title. And so with all the arrogance of youth, I had the temerity to question him at the end of his lecture. Now those of you that knew John can guess the reaction. In 10 seconds flat, he had squashed me. And didn't I feel the absolute idiot? However, imagine my surprise when two weeks later, a letter arrived from Dublin, from John, to say that he'd been thinking over the point that I raised at his lecture, and he was sorry he was so rude, because he now had come to the conclusion that perhaps it had a point after all. <laughs> and there began a decade, decades of friendship. I'll make no bones about it. I do not think Irish land law or Irish conveyance law would have been written if it hadn't been for the quiet influence of John Buckley working behind the scenes. And there are many other people in this jurisdiction who owe John a lot. Now I can feel the spirit saying, come on Wiley, get on with it. So let me move on. This brings me to the title of my lecture, which, with the exception of the word still, is the title of the very first article I wrote over 50 years ago when I was still a student at Queen's. Incidentally, on reflection, I think perhaps I should have made one other alteration to the title and have substituted an exclamation mark for the question mark. <laughs> now, why did I choose this topic? There are many reasons. First, the doctrine has become, over the past 50 years, one of the most controversial aspects of land law. It's derived from statute law, the law relating to limitation of actions, which is now enshrined in our statute of limitations in 1957. The doctrine's controversy, of course, largely derives from a particular feature of its operation, whereby, to put it somewhat crudely, a trespasser on somebody else's land may, if the trespass continues without disturbance for the statutory limitation period, become the owner of the land possessed. What appears extraordinary is that the legal system seems to be sanctioning and rewarding the committal of a civil wrong, without any question of compensation being paid to the dispossessed owner. Indeed, in some jurisdictions, trespassing on land has been made a criminal offence, or has been in England with respect to residential property. But it has been held that this does not prevent the offender from invoking the doctrine to claim title to land. 
This feature alone would justify choosing the topic. But of course it has assumed much greater significance in recent times because of the emphasis on constitutional protection of property rights and human rights generally. It was no surprise that a few years ago a case which arose in England, the famous or notorious Pie case, ended up in the European Court of Human Rights, raising the fundamental issue as to whether the doctrine of adverse possession was compatible with the European Convention. It's a measure of how controversial the doctrine is that conflicting views were expressed on this issue at different levels in the, of the English courts that initially heard the case. Furthermore, ultimately, the Grand Chamber of the European Court, but only be it noted by a majority of 10 votes to 7, reversed the original court's ruling, itself made by only a majority of 4 <coughs> votes to 3, ruled that the doctrine of adverse possession violated the Convention. Notwithstanding the Grand Chamber's ruling upholding the doctrine, controversy continues because some have doubts about the reasoning of the majority of the Grand Chamber. In particular, the distinction drawn between the deprivation of possessions and control of their use, and the Grand Chamber's conclusion that the doctrine evolved only in the latter. The Pi case raised fundamental issues going to the root of the justification for the very existence of the doctrine, and that would also be a reason for choosing the topic. However, I have other reasons. As most of you will know, and as has been mentioned by Judge Lefoy, I was very much involved in the Department of Justice and Law Reform Commission deliberations that ultimately led to the enactment of the Landing Convention Law Reform Act of 2009. Apart from landlord and tenant law, that act has reformed many areas of the law, but the one area that remains unreformed is adverse possession. It's true that the original bill that I drafted for the Department and Commission to implement the proposed reforms did contain provisions on adverse possession, and these were designed not only to implement proposed reform made by the Law Reform Commission in earlier reports, but also, crucially, to address what were perceived to be the difficulties in respect of the European Convention on Human Rights that were then being exhibited by the Pi litigation in the UK. However, the Pi case was still then proceeding through the European court system and the provisions in the draft bill proved to be very controversial. Following strong representations against them from the Law Society's Convention Committee, the government decided it was better to await the outcome of the Pi litigation and so the provisions were pulled from the bill before it was introduced to the Erectus. There was at the time an expectation that the Law Reform Commission would return to the subject once the Grand Chamber had given its final judgment. The topic was included in the Commission's third programme of law reform 2008 to 2014, but it appears, appears that insufficient progress had been made to enable the Commission to bring forward further proposals. <coughs> the Commission did publish a report on limitation of actions in 2011, but that did not cover actions relating to land. If this lecture does nothing else, I would hope that we would at least convince the Commission that the need to revisit adverse possession is overwhelming. In that connection, it's important to reiterate that the provisions of the Law Commission Bill would also have implemented various proposals for reform which might be referred to as technical aspects of how the doctrine operates. The Commission had referred to many uncertainties and anomalies relating to the doctrine, and in giving one of the judgments of the Supreme Court in the recent case of Dunn and Irish Rail, as Justice Lefoy remarked, and I quote, Although none of the aspects of the law which have given rise to controversy in the past have had a bearing on the outcome of this appeal, it must be acknowledged that the appeal illustrates that the law on the doctrine of adverse possession is probably still as controversial as it was in 1989. There would seem to be a need for a review of the recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission in 1989, 2002 and 2005, with a view to bringing clarity to this area of the law you will have gathered that I agree entirely. The purpose of this paper is to indicate what I think such a review of the Commission's recommendations should cover and to suggest what is needed by way of legislation. In doing so, I cannot help recalling the strictures expressed by another Irish judge in one of the very early reported cases on the doctrine of adverse possession, Rankin and McMurtry, a 19th century case. 
In giving one of the judgments of the divisional court in that case, Mr. Justice Holmes remarked, and I quote, I dare say some speculation on the subject has been indulged in by textbook writers whose contributions to legal learning consist in expressing doubts without venturing to offer a solution to them. <laughs> so with that ringing endorsement, <laughs> let me begin with some initial propositions which stem from over 50 years of wrestling with the doctrine of adverse possession and my experience of how it is operated in practice in Ireland. First, there's a vast literature on the subject, reflecting views derived from jurisdictions across the world, which are not restricted, incidentally, to common law jurisdictions. What that literature reveals is how prevalent adherence to some form of the doctrine is, but also a huge variety in the views expressed on fundamental issues, like the justification for the doctrine and the role it plays in land law and conveyance and systems. Secondly, the response of law reform bodies and legislatures has varied enormously and no doubt reflects to some extent the local experience. What is striking is that few jurisdictions have opted for total abolition of the doctrine and it remains operative in most jurisdictions, albeit with substantial modifications in many of them. Instead, notwithstanding the well-documented controversial features of the doctrine, most writers, law reform agencies and legislators have opted for reforms that fall short of total abolition. Thirdly, given the variety of approaches and views taken in other jurisdictions, I very much doubt that a ready-made solution can be found elsewhere which is entirely suitable for Ireland. I'm convinced that we must devise our own solution based very much on our own experience of how the doctrine has operated here. So what would I recommend to the Law Reform Commission by way of a review of its previous proposals? To begin with, Given the controversies which have arisen since the Commission published its previous reports on various aspects of the doctrine, it seems obvious that any review must commence with the fundamental issue of whether the doctrine should be retained at all. Then, if the conclusion of this issue is that it should be retained, the further issue arises to what reforms to the way it operates should be introduced. It's important to stress that in its previous report, the Law Reform Commission did not address explicitly the fundamental issue as to whether the doctrine should be abolished, rather it focused on reforms based on the assumption that it would be retained. The issue of abolition of the doctrine is not, in my view, as clear-cut as the Law Reform Commission perhaps assumed it was when it was working on its reports in the late 1990s and early 2000s. The controversy surrounding the Pi case and the criticisms of the way the doctrine operated made by the judges in both the UK and in the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, illustrate that. The PI ruling by the Grand Chamber may have settled the issue of compliance with the European Convention and arguably with our Constitution, but there remains the extreme unease that many feel about a doctrine which appears to permit a person to become owner of somebody else's land without having to pay for it or give any form of compensation. That unease is, of course, at its highest, where that person is set out deliberately with that purpose in mind, or where the landowner has been unaware of the adverse possession taking place. This, of course, puts an issue the justifications for the doctrine and whether these remain valid today. Interestingly, there has been general agreement as to the justifications for the doctrine, which has also been adopted frequently by law reform agencies. However, it has to be accepted that some of the justifications put forward must be regarded as a doubtful force of validity when set against the unease, if not downright outrage, that some feel about the continued operation of the doctrine. Justifications based on economic arguments, such as encouraging landowners to make full use of their land rather than neglecting it or abandoning it to others, are surely dubious in the extreme. The point is that the doctrine of adverse possession seems to be a very crude way of achieving that purpose, which surely should be achieved by other means on the basis of a properly thought out social and economic policy relating to land use. Such objectives should be the subject of planning and housing law rather than the technical doctrine of land law and the limitation of actions. The same applies to justifications based on the notion that by facilitating squatters to acquire land, the doctrine makes a contribution to social problems like homelessness, 
As has become all too clear in recent times, homelessness is one of the most complex and intractable problems facing modern society, and it is surely naive to think that adverse possession is a solution to it. It is also difficult to accept as a justification the idea that adverse possession avoids what would otherwise be a hardship on the squatter, for example, where he or she has improved the land possessed or otherwise acted to his or her detriment in relation to it. Apart from the fact that this justification comes into play only in some cases of adverse possession, for example, where the squatter has made a mistake and improved what he or she thought was his or her land, it gets into what I regard as most dubious territory, namely application of the doctrine on the basis of the relative merits of the parties' positions. This is a subject I'll return to later. On rather surer ground is a justification which points to the doctrine's place in the law of limitation of actions, that is, the bringing of stale claims. But even this is not really an adequate justification because, of course, adverse possession does more than that. It doesn't just present the landowner for bringing in action to recover possession of the land. It extinguishes his or her title and results in the squatter acquiring title. Clearly, something more is needed to justify this extraordinary effect. It seems to me that the continued operation of the doctrine of adverse possession can only be justified on the basis of the contribution it makes to our conveyancing system. The role of quieting title, to use the old expression, was recognised by the judiciary shortly after the enactment of the first statute introduced on the modern doctrine, the Real Property and Imitation Act of 1833. And this link to title to land is maintained in the reference to title in the key provision in the Statute of Limitations 1957. It's important to emphasise that this has several aspects. One long-standing long aspect is reliance upon the doctrine in the investigation of title to unregistered land. Most conveyances in Ireland will have had the experience of using the doctrine where documentary evidence of title is unavailable because, for example, the title deeds have been lost or destroyed. In such cases, a conveyancing transaction will often have to be completed on the basis of a good holding or possessory title. It is this aspect of the doctrine which underpins the statutory provisions governing the period of title to be deduced by a vendor in the case of unregistered land, which have existed since the enactment of the Vendor and Purchaser Act of 1874, and are now contained in the Land and Conveyance Law Reform Act of 2009. Of course, this aspect doesn't apply to registered land, where title is based on the title shown on the register. Does that mean that the doctrine has no relevance to registered land? Clearly this is a vital consideration given the recent policy of extending the registration system to as much land as possible. Indeed, a number of jurisdictions have taken the view that adverse possession is incompatible with the system of registration of title, but I have to say that most of them ended up retaining it, though sometimes with significant modification. The reason is that the conveyancing aspect of the doctrine is much wider than the lost or destroyed title deeds example I mentioned earlier. The Law Reform Commission pointed this out and said that in Ireland the doctrine is often used to resolve title matters in other situations, such as where a landowner usually inadvertently encroaches on a neighbour's land, a mistaken boundary type situation, and the encroachment does not come to light until many years later when a transaction arises with respect to one of the neighbouring properties. Another example is where following the death of a landowner, no grant of probate or administration is taken out to the estate and again many years later, following occupation of the land by one or some only of the beneficiaries entitled under the will, or more commonly successors entitled in the case of the intestacy, title has to be resolved again according to the doctrine of adverse possession. The crucial point about such situations is that they are equally applicable to registered land. The validity of the Commission's view of the regular use of the doctrine to resolve conveyancing problems is actually borne out by a survey which I conducted in preparing this lecture the large number of reported cases involving the doctrine which has come before the courts since the modern doctrine was formed in the mid-19th century. By far the most numerous cases were those involving ownership of deceased persons' estates, or in a few cases, regularisation of informal family arrangements. Most of the other cases involved either regularising the title to property in order to facilitate a convention transaction, or dealing with the consequence of a boundary mistake or other form of encroachment on nearby land. Only a small minority of the cases involved taking over abandoned or unused land. Interestingly, there appears to be only one example of so-called land theft. The recent case of O'Hagan and Grogan, 
where the squatter, in this case an auctioneer, deliberately seized land for his own purposes, which he knew had belonged to someone else who had died in testate and had no intestate successors, so that it went to the state as the ultimate intestate successor. What is striking about the case law of the past hundred years or so is the large number of cases which involved adverse possession of registered land. The draft of the Local Registration of Title Act 1891 clearly did not think that the doctrine was incompatible with the registration of title system and so included the provision whereby the squatter could become owner of the registered title. That provision has since been carried forward in a modified form in section 49 of the Registration of Title Act 1964, hence my query when John Buckley gave his lecture. Notwithstanding evidence that some of these conveyance examples may not arise now as frequently as they used to in the past, for example, the need to secure entitlement to EU grants and subsidies for farms has encouraged the taking out of grants of probate and administration in more recent times, my conclusion is that all this results in the doctrine still continuing to play a vital role in facilitating conveyance and transactions and is likely to be able to do so in the foreseeable future. In my view, notwithstanding the controversial features of the doctrine, a case for its abolition cannot be sustained. That brings me to the issue of what reforms should be made to the doctrine if it is to continue. A study of the vast literature of the subject reveals that there are two main types of reform which are either enacted or proposed. One type is what I call structural reform, which is reform which usually aims to remove features of the doctrine which are perceived to be unfair or unethical. It usually involves depriving certain types of squatters of the benefit of the doctrine or providing the dispossessed owner with greater protection. It therefore usually results in a substantial restriction on the scope of the doctrine. The other type of reform is what I call technical reform, which usually involves adjustments to the rules governing the doctrine's operation in particular cases. The Law Reform Commission's previous recommendations largely concerned only this second category. Let me now briefly consider each category in turn. Let's take first of all structural reform. Those who advocate such reform are usually concerned with removing from the doctrine those features which are regarded as inappropriate to the legal system, such as permitting so-called land theft or penalising unfairly a landowner for failing to use his land or to keep an eye on it. The result is that there have been proposed or enacted in some jurisdictions various restrictions on the scope of the doctrine which usually import what might be described as an ethical element. Examples of such an element are restricting the doctrine's operation to squatters who act in, quote, good faith, or who can base their claim on colour of title, that is, someone who would have had a clear title if there wasn't some defect in the conveyancing documentation. Indeed, it's even been argued in some jurisdictions that the courts have imported such ethical elements because of the way they've applied or interpreted the legislation in question. But should such a restriction be introduced here? I must confess that I have considerable reservations about going down this route for a number of reasons. First, it's important to emphasise that there is no suggestion of any such elements in the provisions of the statute of limitations. Those provisions are entirely neutral on the merits of the positions of the landowner and squatter. Arguably, all the statute requires is establishment of basic facts. Has someone gone into possession of someone else's land so as to give the landowner a right to bring an action to recover possession, which is not brought within the requisite limitation period? Secondly, introducing a restriction relating to the merits of the squatter's position begs the question as to why the merits of the landowner's position should not also be thrown into the mix. All too often there has been a failure to recognise that restricting squatter's scope for invoking the doctrine in order to protect dispossessed landowners involves not just a value judgment about the merits of the squatter's position, but also by implication the merits of the dispossessed landowner's position. For example, it necessarily involves sanctioning landowners not looking after the properties and not making economic use of it. For this reason, the position adopted by the Law Commissioner for England and Wales with respect to registered land and implemented in the Land Registration Act of 2002 has been strongly criticised. This introduced a so-called veto system 
whereby in most cases the dispossessed registered owner facing an application for registration by a squatter is warned by the land registry of the application and given a further two years in which to evict the squatter. Arguably what criticisms of this illustrate is that introducing ethical considerations into essentially the neutral and simple judgment for the statute of limitations requires in each case but surely invite complexity and uncertainty. In a recent case, the argument was made that adverse, adverse possession of a property in, I quote, total disrepair and virtual dereliction had not occurred because, it was argued, being unsuitable for human habitation, it was not capable of enjoyment. Nevertheless, the squatter, who had very simple needs, had occupied it for many years, and Mr Justice Hogan, quite rightly in my view, rejected the argument. As he put it, if the plaintiff's submission were correct, it would mean that the courts might be required to inquire into the subjective tastes and feelings of landowners for the purposes of assessing whether the law on adverse possession applied to that particular property, thus adding needless complexity to an area of the law which is already beset with its own difficulties. I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> this point comes into stark focus when you consider exactly how you would restrict the categories of squatters who would be entitled in future to invoke the doctrine of adverse possession. You are immediately faced with the issue of where do you draw the line? Squatters clearly fall into a wide range of categories of varying merit. For example, one who is fully aware that he or she is occupying someone else's land and intends to acquire it by adverse possession. Then you have one who is again fully aware that it is someone else's land, but does not intend to acquire title because he or she is unaware of the doctrine of adverse possession. Or you have one who takes possession of land, not sure who the owner is, but perhaps believing he or she might be the owner, which belief might or might not be reasonable. One who takes possession mistakenly believing he or she is the owner, but having no reasonable grounds for that belief or one who takes us possession, but having reasonable grounds of belief, and so on. And if ethical considerations are to come into play, this would also apply to dispossessed landowners, where again the issue of where to draw the line would arise. Different categories of very emerge would include the owner who simply abandons the land intentionally, or the owner who does not intend to abandon the land, but until fails to keep an eye on it. Or the owner who is aware of the squatting but turns a blind eye in order to avoid a dispute or to promote good neighbourliness. Or the owner who is unaware of the squatting because he or she mistakenly believes the land belongs to the squatter. A proper ethical approach would involve weighing in the balance the respective merits of both dispossessed owner and squatter in each individual case. I have no hesitation in saying that devising a legislative scheme to achieve this which the courts would find satisfactory to operate, would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. I must also say that I have similar reservations about introducing with general application greater protection for dispossessed owners, so as, for example, to protect them from losing the land through mere inadvertence or oversight. The typical example is the veto system introduced in England and Wales for registered land, which I mentioned earlier. As I said, under this, in most cases, the register owner is given a warning of the application by the squad for registration and is then given the opportunity to object to it and then another two years in which to take action to get rid of the squatter. The squatter will succeed only in becoming the owner if the existing registered owner fails to take action in that two-year period. While I recognise the apparent attraction of such a system for introducing what might be regarded as more fairness into the, how the doctrine operates, there are, seems to be, a number of difficulties. First is the practical one, that the system works more easily with respect to registered land, because, of course, the register tells you who the owner is to whom a warning can be given of the squatter's application. Often, in the case of unregistered land, the squatter will not know who owns the land possessed. That problem may be overcome to some extent by requiring the posting of a warning notice on the land and placing notices in local newspapers in accordance with traditional land registry practice. This may, of course, not always work to protect the landowner. In any event, there would have to be a mechanism for ensuring that such notices were placed. Then there is the issue with respect to unregistered land as to when the squatter would obtain title under such a system. 
There may be an argument that such a system should be linked to the strategy of extending registration of title, so that in the future a squatter would not obtain title unless he or she made an application for registration, and the property registration authority would then supervise the placing of notice. In effect, the claim to title by a squatter would be added to the triggering events requiring compulsive registration. The danger of this is that we would add complexity to how the doctor operates and to costs incurred by squatters claiming to have acquired title to, advert, advert, to unregistered land. I do accept that there's a risk of exaggerating the point that such a system would interfere, interfere with the long standing convention in practice of many years, whereby transactions are completed on the basis of a good holding or possessory title. It was partly in such grounds that the Law Society opposed the provisions of the Law Reform Commission's original bill, which were subsequently dropped. But the issue of a good holding and possessory title arises often in other transactions which would not necessarily be a triggering event. Apart from that, there remain the fundamental objection to any system which in effect purports to alter how the doctor operates on the basis of the alleged merit of a particular party's position in certain circumstances. It seems to me that for any form to have legitimacy, it must be based on the fullest assessment and evaluation of the merits and demerits of all interested parties in all the circumstances. And I repeat my doubts as to whether it is possible to devise such a system which fulfills the essential requirements of certainty and practicality. I do recognise that there may be a special case for protecting public bodies which own large tracts of land scattered across the country, making it very difficult to keep an eye on all the land. However, the better solution in such cases might be to apply a longer limitation period for state bodies and to extend the categories of state authority in the definition in the statute of limitations. In any event, the Supreme Court decision in O'Hagan and Grogan surely suggests that a need to look at that definition arises. To mention the Law Reform Commission's original bill proposals prompts me to mention an aspect of those provisions, which was the provision giving the court a discretion to order a successful squatter to pay compensation to the dispossessed owner. That proposal was, of course, intended to address the fears then current about the doctrine's compatibility with the European Convention, which was eventually put to rest by the European Court. However, again, the Law Society strongly objected to a system involving the squad or having to seek a vesting order from the court, which would have to be registered and becoming subject to a possible compensation order as an unnecessary and inappropriate way to amend the doctrine. On reflection, given my previous remarks, I'm inclined to agree. I'd also add that the notion that compensation may be payable by the dispossessed owner, of course, again involves a dubious value judgment of the merits of the respective positions of the interested parties. It is perhaps interesting that in the High Court judgment in the recent Don and Irish Rail case, Mr Justice Clark, albeit Oberter, recommended that the then dispossessed owner, CIE, which had successfully resisted the squatter's claim, should come to some, and I quote, modest accommodation with the squatter and exercise some generosity. In other words, instead of the squatter having to compensate the landowner, the landowner should compensate the squatter. This strikes me as further illustration of the difficulties of basing the doctrine on the judgment of the apparent merits of the respective interested parties. My conclusion is, therefore, that an attempt to introduce in Ireland the sort of structural reform which I've mentioned would be fraught with difficulty and likely to make the doctrine already riddled with anomalies and uncertainties even more so. So this leads me to address those uncertainties and anomalies and the subject of technical reform. This involves largely a consideration of the very recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission which Ms Justice Lefoy said should be reviewed. Time doesn't permit me to carry out an in-depth review, so I'll confine myself to commenting on and indicating whether I agree with those various recommendations. I must own up to being a party to many of them, but that doesn't mean that I haven't had second thoughts about some of them. <laughs> I would also suggest that there may be one or two other aspects that merit legislative innovation. One of the long-standing difficulties about applying the doctrine of adverse possession 
is that although the statute of limitations refers to the need to establish, quote, adverse possession, it doesn't actually say what that is. It has been left to the courts to determine what it means. There's been a large measure of agreement on this, to the effect that it is a question of fact dependent upon the circumstances of each case, and requires the establishment of two elements. The taking of possession of somebody else's land, the so-called physical control element, and an intention to possess it to the exclusion of others, the so-called animus possidendi element. There has, however, been considerable controversy in the Irish courts about what actions a landowner should have taken in respect of the land in order to prevent adverse possession taking place, with commentators drawing different conclusions from the case law. Thankfully, however, the Supreme Court has now given the defendant the ruling at this point in the Dunn Irish Real case, affirming the view taken by Mr Justice Clark in the High Court. The position in Ireland is that there is a presumption that the paper title owner intends to possess his land, and it takes only, and I quote, minimal acts on his part in relation to it to defeat a claim to adverse possession by a squatter. That is, the paper title owner only has to meet a very low threshold to defeat the squatter's claim. Notwithstanding doubts expressed by the court as to the validity of some previous decisions on this question, it seems to me that the general principle has now been settled by the Supreme Court, and so there is no need for legislative interference. The Supreme Court reiterated the point made in previous cases that each case must depend on its own circumstances, and what is required of a landowner to protect this interest will depend very much on the nature of the land in question, and what use can be made of it. Such fact-specific matters are not appropriate for legislation and should be left at the courts. There is, however, on the other hand, a related but again very controversial matter in which the Irish courts have given again different views. This is the so-called rule in Lee and Jack, a late 19th century English case which propounded the proposition that there can be no adverse possession where the paper title owner has no immediate use for the land taken over by the squatter because he or she has some future plans for its use. The rule was resurrected in more recent times by the English Court of Appeal, then firmly rejected by that court in a later case, and it was firmly rejected finally by the House of Lords in the Pie case. The Irish courts have unfortunately adopted different positions on this particular rule, though the trend is towards rejection of it. In the recent Irish Real case, Mr Justice Clark in the High Court made it clear that he preferred the reasoning in the cases rejecting the rule, but the Supreme Court, taking the view that the point did not arise for a decision on the appeal in that case, did not make a definitive ruling on the point. I understand that the Property Registration Authority has taken the view that the rule still applies here. So at the very least, it seems to me, there is some doubt which raises the question to whether there should be legislative interference. In fact, in its first consideration of the doctrine, the Law Reform Commission drew attention to this issue and recommended that the statutory provision should be enacted to ensure that the court should not regard the intention of the landowner as a decisive factor in considering whether or not he or she had been dispossessed. It recommended that adverse possession should be defined as being, and I quote, possession inconsistent with the title of the true owner, not possession inconsistent with the intention of the true owner. Just such a provision was included later in the Law Reform Commission's draft bill, but of course that was lost when those provisions were withdrawn by the government. It's been suggested that such a provision does not just deal with the Lee and Jack principle, but would, in fact, have eliminated, eliminated the requirement of anonymous possidendi. That may indeed be so, but would that necessarily be inappropriate? I would reiterate that the statute of limitations does not lay down what amounts to adverse possession, and the traditional twin requirement of physical control and anonymous possidendi by the shorter, with a gloss put on it by the courts. Section 18 of our statute, in stating that the owner's right of action shall not be deemed to accrue unless and until adverse possession is taken of the land, makes no mention of any intentions, whether of the owner or the squatter. Arguably, the drafter never intended intentions, which have obvious subjective connotations, to be relevant. And instead, as the word taken suggests, was concerned only with the other requirement of physical control. It seems to me arguable that the intention requirement is an unnecessary and unwarranted complication. 
Instead, a court should concentrate on the physical control requirement as a purely objective test of fact. The essential question in each case should be, did the alleged squatter take sufficient physical control of the land to give rise to the right of the owner to bring in action for the recovery of possession and maintain that control for the requisite limitation period? It follows that I agree with the Commission's view on this matter and the legislation that they proposed. I turn now quickly to another of the most controversial aspects of the doctrine. This again arises from the wording in the statute of limitations and the judicial clause put upon it. It confirms, concerns the fundamental issue as to what exactly is the effect of a squatter successfully invoking the doctrine. The problem derives from the wording in the statute, which is couched in purely negative terms. Our statute, like many similar statutes, simply says that the title of the person whose action is barred on expiry of the limitation period is, quote, extinguished. Two points may be noted immediately. First, the statute says that it is the paper owner's title which is extinguished, not the ownership, or to be technically more correct, the estate he held or lease owned in the land to which that title relates. Arguably, this is a point which is often overlooked, but nevertheless, it does look like a deliberate piece of drafting, which must have some significance. Secondly, while the statute says what the effect of successful adverse possession is on the dispossessed owner, it doesn't say what the effect is on the squatter. What does he or she obtain? This has given rise to the question as to whether the statute affects a parliamentary conveyance or statutory transfer of the dispossessed owner's estate to the squatter. Arguably, given that the dispossessed owner's title only is extinguished, the estate in the land must survive and must, by implication, pass to the person who now has the better title or claim to it, the squatter. That, indeed, was the view adopted in the mid-19th century by Irish courts and in the leading divisional court decision I mentioned earlier, Rankin and McMurtry. It has always been the view of the land registry, supported by court orders made under the Local Registration of Title Act, that the dispossessed owner's registered estate remains and the squatter should be entered as the new owner of that estate. In my view, the courts lost their way after the English Court of Appeal in the 1890s ruled that, at least with respect to unregistered land, there is no parliamentary convention to transfer the dispossessed owner's estate to the squatter. That view was ultimately confirmed by the House of Lords in the 1960s in the notorious case of Feather and the St. Marybone Property Company, which involved a typical boundary mistake situation, but more importantly, leasehold land. The case illustrated the extreme anomalies and difficulties which arise in the case of leasehold land if you do not apply the parliamentary conveyance theory, and the contortions indulged in by the law lords in that case were subject to scathing criticisms. Indeed, my article published 50 years ago was prompted by the Fairweather case, and in particular my concern about the implications for Ireland, where so much property is held under very long leases. The regrettable thing is that the Irish courts accepted the new parliamentary conveyance view taken by the English courts, and this was confirmed by the Supreme Court in the 1970s in Perry and Wood Farm Homes. Admittedly, the Supreme Court did not follow all aspects of the Fairweather decision and provided some protection for squatters in the case of a surrender or merger of the lease, but there's no doubt that the law has remained in a thoroughly unsatisfactory state. However, I need not go into this aspect of the doctrine further because it was reviewed extensively by the Law Reform Commission, which recommended detailed provisions to introduce a parliamentary conveyance system, and it did provide draft legislation to implement that, and I commend it to you. In making its recommendations on the parliamentary conveyance issue, the Law Reform Commission drew attention to another matter relating to leasehold law, and that's the law of encroachment. That is, where a tenant encroaches upon land adjacent to or adjoining the demised premises. The general rule is that there is a presumption that the tenant's encroachment is for the landlord's benefit, so that although the tenant may enjoy rights in respect of the encroached upon land during the remainder of the tenancy, upon determination of the tenancy, the encroached upon land passes to the landlord. The Commission pointed out that the basis for this presumption was much disputed as indeed is the relevance of the doctrine of adverse possession. But the Commission concluded that there should be no legislative interference with the current law. But my view is 
that the current law is so uncertain and riddled with such dubious consequences that some intervention is justified. But in saying that, it's important to distinguish between two situations. One, where the land encroached upon also belongs to the tenant's landlord. And secondly, where the land belongs to a third party having no connection with the landlord or tenant. Let me take each of these in turn. Where the encroached upon land also belongs to the landlord, there is some obvious practical sense in taking the view that it should become an adjunct to the demise premises and become subject to the same terms as those applying to the demise premises and the lease. The basis for the presumption in this situation is not entirely clear, and it must be doubted whether the law of adverse possession is relevant. It has been said that the presumption arises in such cases from a kind of estoppel derived from the relationship of landlord and tenant, and that the law of estoppel is the better principle for dealing with disputes as to the party's position in such cases. I am inclined to agree, but I would add that there may be a need for some legislative clarification. In particular, it seems to me that if the presumption is to apply in such cases, it should be made clear that the tenant's position with respect to the encroached upon land is the same as the position as regards the demise land. It should be regarded as fully part of the lease, so that any statutory rights attaching to the lease, such as the right to a new tenancy or a reversionary lease, or the right to buy out the freehold, should apply also to the encroached upon land. This should be on the basis that the encroached upon land has become part of the demise premises and entitlement to such statutory rights should be governed by the relevant law in the normal way. Turning then to the other situation where the land encroached upon has nothing to do with the encroaching tenant's landlord and instead belongs to a third party. This is surely an entirely different case. It's extremely difficult to see why the presumption that the tenant is acting for the landlord's benefit in such a case. The usual reason given is that the tenants will be given the opportunity to encroach upon the neighbouring land belonging to the third party by virtue of the lease granted by the landlord, and so must be regarded as acting for the landlord's benefit. <coughs> this seems a highly dubious proposition, which is difficult to square, square with the contractual relationship of landlord and tenant established in Ireland as long as go the Jesus Act. I actually cannot do better than quote from Brady and Kerr in their book, who would say, the extension of the presumption to encroachment by tenants and property belonging to third parties rests on no principle which is defensible in modern conditions. I really do think that the Law Reform Commission were wrong to conclude that nothing should be done about this sort of case. It seems to me the legislation should make it clear that the presumption in favour of the landlord should not apply in a case where the tenant is encroaching on land belonging to a third party. The tenant should acquire a field release title titled on the encroached upon land quite independent of the lease. It would remain open, of course, to the landlord and tenant to come to some arrangement for the remainder of the lease with respect to that land, but that's a matter for negotiation and contract. It should not be imposed by the law. I know the Law Reform Commission were concerned that removal of presumptions in such cases might leave small, possibly inaccessible plots of land held by former tenants, but that seems to me a risk that must be run in order to protect his other otherwise an unjustifiable and grossly unfair legal presumption. I see no reason why the landlord should obtain a windfall at the expense of the tenant in such cases, and if in some cases what the tenant obtains is not much use to him, so be it. <coughs> Let me conclude then with a few other matters, some of which I will mention very briefly. One is that the Law Reform Commission pointed out that there are different limitation periods that apply where you were dealing with deceased persons' estates and thought that some rationalisation of these should be brought about. I agree with that. The Law Reform Commission also dealt with provisions in the statute of limitations dealing with periodic tenancies and the distinction drawn in the statute between oral tenancies and tenancies in writing. Again, I agree with what the Law Reform Commission said in respect of that. Let me finish, however, with a personal plea. Over 20 years ago, I wrote an article in a journal which may not be in everyone's reading list. It was the Western Law Gazette, which I believe is the journal of the University College Galway Law Graduates Association. <coughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. It concerned the application of the doctrine of adverse possession to fee farm grants. <coughs> 
in particular, the consequence of the grantee not paying the fee farm rent. This remains an important issue because although the Land and Convention Law Reform Act prohibited the creation of new fee farm grants, it did not affect existing ones and much land in Ireland will continue to be held on the fee farm grants well into the future. The general rule, of course, is that non-payment of a leasehold rent for six or more years merely bars the landlord's right to recover the rent. It does not affect the landlord's reversionary title, nor the right to recover arrears of rent less than six years old, and, of course, the right to collect future rent. But this rule applies only to what the statute of limitations refers to as a conventional rent. And I pointed out in my article that a fee farm rent of any type, including the grants creating the relationship of landlord and tenant, does not come within that definition. Instead, fee farm rents are treated by the statute like rent charges and regarded as an encumbrance on the land to which the doctrine of adverse possession applies. So that 12 years non-payment of a fee farm rent extinguishes the grantor's <coughs> title. I pointed out that there is little case law on this subject, but I expressed the view that the effect of the doctrine was not only to destroy the grantor's remedies for the recovery of the fee farm rent, but also, just as important, the right to enforce other covenants, such as those restricting the use of the land in the fee farm grant. I understand that over the years, the land registry has felt unable, in the absence of other authority, to accept this view. So I think it's time legislation was enacted to confirm my view. <laughs>